Thank you, Dean Goldman, for your kind uh, introduction. I also want to thank the entire the University of Southern California, especially the, uh, the schools of public policy and engineering and their affiliate, the Center for Sustainability Solutions, for inviting me to speak today. I'm honored uh, to be here. The IPCC and USC are no strangers to the, each other. Uh, I understand that your president, Carol Fault, uh, who is a well-regarded bi uh, biologist, uh, was an IPCC author uh, for the fourth assessment. Uh, more recently, the Price School's professor, Antonio Bento, that was a contributing author to the IPCC's uh, fifth assessment. Professor Wendy Bruin de Bruin uh, and their colleagues at USC and the uh, UN Foundation uh, conducted two studies, very interesting studies, one related to the IPCC graphics and another to its language, and that informed uh, portions of the, of the sixth uh, assessment. And Lance Inyong, the, the head of the communications for the Price School, uh, was my communication specialist for the sixth, uh, um, uh, sixth assessment, the synthesis report. Thank you, Inyo. Lance. Inyo. My apologies to anyone that I may have, I may have neglected uh, to mention. I encourage anyone whose research is relevant to climate change to consider becoming an IPCC author. It is a demanding role, uh, but let me assure you that a very immensely uh, rewarding one. When I began my tenure as chair of the IPCC in 2015, I vowed to focus on the solutions uh, that are already at hand and which are being supplemented by the astonishing growth of new breakthroughs. We already know that humanity is causing the problem and we have ample proof that the climate change is a grave threat to our well-being and to the well-being of the entire planet. While the science to understand the climate change will continue to un un uh, reveal new and valuable insights, we have an even greater need to focus on solutions. Solutions not only offer the tangible ways to address the challenge, they provide hope. And hope is absolutely essential. Hope drives our motivation to confront climate change, and it is the wellspring of innovations and cooperation. Thankfully, there is reason for hope. And this is the key message, may I say that, key message from the IPCC Sixth Assessment Report. You see it in the outpouring of new technologies and approaches from the private sector. And you see it at universities just as the USC, where fundamental and applied research laid the foundation for climate solutions. I'd like to use the remainder of my time to tell you about the findings of the IPCC Synthesis Report. Released last March, the report was the final installment of the IPCC Sixth Assessment. As chair of the IPCC, it was my responsibility to ensure the completion of the synthesis report. It is easier said that than done, truly. As the report's name implies, uh, it, is, it synthesizes, summarized, uh, if you like, the findings, of, findings from the three uh, previous special reports and three uh, working group reports that were published since the conclusion of the previous assessment uh, cycle. The last assessment was completed in 2015. 2013, that is the fifth assessment report. So this one is really the update of the scientific understanding of findings of the climate change related science impacts as well as the response measures to it. The report warns that the pace scale of what has been done so far and current plans fell well short of what's needed. We are working when we should be sprinting. A rapid, deep, sustained reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and accelerated adaptation to climate change are essential, uh, not in the future, but now, uh, in this decade. As you may recall, the Paris Agreement called for nations to hold 
global average temperatures to well below 2 degrees Celsius uh, above pre-industrial levels. But it, better yet, we should try to limit the increase to 1.5 degrees. But remaining at or below 1.5 degrees is a tall order. The average temperature has already increased 1.1 degrees. Meanwhile, national commitment to reduce emissions are not nearly ambitious enough. They make it likely that, according to our synthesis report, uh, warming will exceed 1.5 degrees and make it harder to limit warming to below 2 degrees. In 2018, the IPCC highlighted the challenge of keeping warming to 1.5 degrees. It was done through the special report uh, invited by the Paris Agreement uh, for the IPCC to conduct the, this special report on 1.5 degrees warming. Uh, five years later, this challenge is even greater. The impact of human-caused climate change are unfolding with frightened clarity in every region of the world. The impacts include more frequent, more, in, in, more intense droughts and flooding, uh, rising threats to our food and water security, the undermining of livelihoods, and damage to the global economy. Climate change is literally killing people. Every increment of warming will lead to rapidly escalating hazards and widening regional differences. When climate risks combine with other adverse impact events, such as pandemics or conflicts, they become even more difficult to manage. And the higher temperature get, the higher the likelihood of abrupt and or irre irreversible changes. For example, there is evidence, though very limited at this moment, that sustained warming between 2 and 3 degrees Celsius would lead to the complete loss of the ice sheets in Greenland and West Antarctica. This could raise the levels of our, our oceans by 2 meters, uh, or 6.5 feet, by 2100, and more than 15 meters, nearly 50 feet, by 2300. Uh, this information are dearly uh, held by our working group two the experts within IPCC, and they want to inform the world to be you know, the knowledgeable about this sort of information, although it you know, refers to something may happen in 2300, but it, our the scientists in working group two really believes this is an important information. The report makes it clear that humanity is not doing enough to adapt to a warmer world. Indeed, we will start to reach the limits of our ability to adapt to climate change unless we halt and ultimately reverse the warming trend. It is possible to reverse the warming trend. No matter what we do now, the Earth will continue to grow hotter and human suffering will worsen. The question is, how much worse will it get? The answer is entirely up to us. The good news is that the world has technology, knowledge, and capital to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. Effective and equitable climate action now can lead to a more sustainable, resilient, and just world. The more ambitious we are, the wider the benefits of nature and people. So what do we need to do now? We we'll need to cut our emissions by almost half by 2030, so seven years from now, if we want a chance to stay at below 1.5 degrees Celsius. And we'll need to reach net zero by 2050. That means not only cutting greenhouse gas emissions to as close to net zero, pos to zero possible, but it also means reabsorbing emissions from the atmosphere. The Rapid sustained reductions in emissions would lead to a noticeable slowdown in warming, not now, but in two decades. We could, however, see improvements in air quality in just about a few years by reducing air pollution emissions. Indeed, it was estimated that the economic benefits for the people's health from the air quality improvement would be roughly the same and possibly even larger than the cost of reducing or avoiding the emissions. 
The synthesis report identifies proven policies and practices that can work in diverse contexts to reduce emissions and advance, and advance climate uh, resilience. The near-term solutions outlined in the synthesis report uh, fall into uh, five categories. Energy, first, and second, land, water, and food, and third, settlements and infrastructure, and fourth, health, and lastly, society, livelihoods, and the economy. It will come as no surprise to anyone in this room that solar and wind power offer by far the greatest potential for reducing emissions caused by electricity generation. There are also gains through the less dramatic, though less dramatic, to be made by reducing methane emissions from coal, oil, and gas. Bioelectricity, geothermal, hydropower, and nuclear power are also on the list of clean power alternatives. The list also includes the capture and storage or use of CO2 emissions. And when it comes to land, water, and food, the greatest opportunities for cutting emissions come from reducing the conversion of natural ecosystems to commercial purposes. This underscores that if we literally take care of the earth, it will take care of us. We can also make significant strides by restoring our ecosystems to, so that they can better absorb emissions. Additional opportunities for reducing emissions can come from improving the energy efficiency of our buildings, using more fuel-efficient and electric vehicles, and improving recycling, which I understand is a major initiative at this uh, USC. Tackling climate change can also provide valuable co-benefits. I mentioned just one example of health benefits from the reduced air pollution. The shifting to working, cycling, and more sustainable diets will improve our health here. A better adaptation can improve agricultural productivity, innovation, food security, and biodiversity conservation. Now, let's take a look at some non-technical solutions. One of the essential findings of the special the synthesis report is the value of fairness. Those who contributed the least to the climate change are often the most vulnerable to its impact. In the previous decade, people lived in areas uh, highly vulnerable uh, to the climate impacts were up to 15 times, up to 15 times, uh, more likely to die in floods, droughts, and storms. We cannot solve this problem by leaving people and the region behind. The path to a safer, more equitable, and sustainable future for all requires three to six times the current amount of financing. But there are enough capital financial resources available to rapidly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It's not just about the quantity of money, however. It's about the how and where it is allocated. Uh, vulnerable areas just don't have enough money to fund the urgent need to adapt to climate change. This is why developed nations must provide financial support to developing nations to help them transition to low carbon economies and adapt to the impact of climate change. Combined together, this can be a climate resilient development strategy, development pathways. Governments can reduce the barriers that are holding back investment through public funding and clear and also clear signals to investors. We also know that the path to a more secure future requires political commitment and inclusive governance. It relies on international cooperation, ecosystem stewardship, and the sharing of diverse knowledge, values, and worldviews. There's one other solution that is not contained in the synthesis report but which I have learned through experience. It is the way we communicate climate change. It's too often, uh, those of us in the know-how use complex words and very tortured sentences to convey climate change. I should know that I worked for the IPCC, and uh, sort of a, this is a confession that I suspect even some policymakers have difficulty understanding the IPCC reports. Every plenary for approval of summary for policymakers, we have heard 
right from the floor that policymakers themselves indicate that IPCC reports is becoming unreadable. That's what they told in open discussions. But it's no one's fault. It, it's what happens when a, literally hundreds of people uh, write and edit each IPCC report. I'm sure Naki probably will attest to that when it comes to the, uh, discuss this matter later on. But it is through my experience with the IPCC that I've come to appreciate the value of simple language. Not only is it easier to understand, it avoids alienating readers. I advise all of us to follow the findings of your own Professor Bruin de Bruin, who I mentioned at the outset. She and her colleagues found that some of the words IPCC and many others use almost daily, mitigation adaptation, for example, are not easily understood by a non-scientific audience. I was surprised to hear this uh, result of uh, her research. So you can imagine how dumbfounding and annoying the term existential threat must be to millions of people. Now, this existential threat was mentioned by none other than Secretary General, UN Secretary General, whenever he mentioned climate change. Instead of uniting us in common cause, complicated language divides us. And unity is essential to building the trust and collaboration that is a fundamental requirement for con countering the climate crisis. We can succeed if we are united in common cause, just as we will fail if we are not. That's why climate action requires the best of each one of us. We need empathy to recognize that we live in a diverse world in which everyone has different responsibilities and different abilities to enact change. Some can do a lot, while others will need help managing the change. And that change will be shaped by the choices we make starting now. So let's hope we make the right choices because the ones we make now and in the next few years will reverberate around the world for hundreds, even thousands of years. So thank you very much, and I would be happy to take some of your questions. So much of what the IPCC does is very high level. Governments, big business. What can the individual person do? I think this, uh, sometimes I receive the question in, uh, what do you do as a chair of IPCC? <laughs> and uh, so, you know, individual, I've thought of uh, that question for a very long time. Uh, I, I see some uh, misalignment uh, between the, uh, the way the, uh, the, way the, uh, the individual uh, person as consumer or investor makes every day in, in every day's decision and the result of those aggregated result of those when compared with the uh, global goal of uh, reducing the uh, emissions as early as possible not later than 2025 uh, and also reducing also the, you know, limiting the uh, uh, temperature as much as possible. Now, we all agree that uh, limiting warming is very important, but in our daily lives, our decisions are not really uh, much uh, geared to uh, achieving, approaching that goal. So what, what makes the, uh, uh, such a gap exist for so long a time? And, uh, well, economist has uh, some suggestions for that, uh, but uh, you know it's usually the uh, pricing uh, things. But in reality, uh, you know, all of you know that uh, it has uh, some difficulties in uh, applying such uh, measures. So I think the uh, uh, the big challenge for all of us, the investor, consumer, or policymaker, or you know, producer or whatever manufactured goods, 
uh, faces a great difficulty in aligning uh, every day's decision uh, with the uh, humanity's goal of uh, reducing carbon emissions. And what individuals can do under this misalignment, what individuals can do, practically very little. You know, we are working with infrastructure. We are living with infrastructure. Unless this infrastructure provides us a choices uh, such that uh, I can reduce my emissions by making certain choices, uh, that would be wonderful. But if inf such infrastructure uh, doesn't exist around me, around my neighbor, then what can I do that much? Therefore, the government's role here in this very important. It is the government that must plan for climate resilient infrastructure, climate resilient development pathways can be you know, made through a uh, right infrastructure decision. So, you know, as an individual, influence government to take a right decision. That's what individuals can do. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Um, j just to build upon that, um, we are seeing there's uh, some issues developing in the House of Representatives for a Speaker of the House, and we're also heading into an election year. How would you advise industry to move forward um, to sort of meet the challenge uh, with our political leaders that might not agree with the climate issues or, or addressing them? Well, uh, we, have, we, we, we have seen a great deal of improvement in the reducing uh, plans to reduce carbon emissions in the electricity, electricity sector. sector. Uh, We've seen a tremendous uh, improvement in the performance of the renewable technologies. Uh, so it's good. it's good as far as it goes. Now, this moment we also see a great deal of challenges still remaining in the industry sector, especially like the uh, steel, cement, petrochemical, and also the, uh, lots of the, the IT-related industries require a high degree of electricity consumption. Now, this steel, cement, petrochemical requires a great deal of heat, high temperature heat. And uh, this requires, currently, uh, we don't have uh, much uh, options available to reduce, substitute the traditional way of producing uh, these key materials. The world will need to have these key materials, no matter what. And uh, now, to have these uh, new tech have these new options available for these very important sectors, about currently 10% of greenhouse gas emissions are coming from this uh, uh, petrochemical and steel cement. Every country needs government help in this regard. And uh, these materials are highly competitive across, across the world. They are very important. They are very active in trade, and they operate on a very small margin. And they are really not in the position of introducing or uh, thinking of themselves being a first mover in this case. And uh, clearly I see the um, uh, great benefits from the public inter government intervention uh, to support the decarbonization of these industries as early as possible. And again, I don't know. Uh, every country has different political system and political uh, concepts, ideas. And uh, I hope that in the end, uh, they all recognize that uh, science uh, is very clear on this point. But at the same time, I uh, appreciate the, um, the, the discussions uh, held in the political arena. Uh, 
I myself uh, was uh, more or less uh, uh, in between this analytical community, the communities of analysts, and also in the communities of the, uh, the policy uh, development, policy implementation. And uh, the policy side always consider two elements based upon my experience. Uh, efficiency, obviously, is, is the one. And then equity questions. And uh, you know, there's the losers and uh, also winners. Uh, it, it is a politician's job to uh, find some right balance between these two uh, you know, groups. And uh, so uh, I hope that the, uh, we would have some... I want to be optimistic. And, uh, you know, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, I uh, love to say that the tipping points uh, you know, can, tipping points exist in both ways, uh, downfall or the, up, downfall or, the, you know, the very optimistic solution. So let's hope for the best. Uh, several questions to your left over here. I want to say uh, what a pleasure it is to be able to even ask you a question. So thank you for coming to USC today. Uh, my question is about public opinion in the marketplace. I'm thinking about the cigarettes. Cigarettes were enormously popular around the world, and it was a public education campaign that helped create an awareness that lowered cigarette use. That was an effective example of influencing public opinion for a positive social change. Some people think we're well past messaging campaigns and climate change. It's not about public opinion. It's really about the marketplace. And if there's not a profit incentive for businesses to make more money in green ways, then the situation is, is untenable. So I wanted to ask you for two specific things. Can you name a single example of an effective public opinion campaign to advance climate progress? The one that for you is an effective example. And two, if you can point to one example of a technological development that you think can help to mitigate climate change in a way that impresses you. I'm looking for something specific that I can become hopeful about. Yes, very uh, good, excellent questions. Uh, re with regard to the, the public messaging uh, impacting the uh, uh, climate action and also the producing the positive uh, uh, result. Uh, I was in the, uh, uh, another conference uh, two weeks, two weeks in, in Tokyo. And uh, <clears throat> one gentleman came to me after the uh, talk. Uh, he said that uh, he uh, told me that uh, engineering, uh, superb engineering, uh, to his understanding, was not the uh, uh, question uh, was, was not the key factor in uh, uh, deploying a climate-friendly uh, technologies. So I asked him, what, what was that? And he said that uh, he was the man uh, developed uh, Prius, uh, the very earliest model of Prius. And he uh, spent most of his time to um, perfecting the, the engineering capabilities of this Prius model. But the sales didn't uh, pick up. And then suddenly he noticed that the sales in the United States of the Prius model suddenly exploded. After, that happened after uh, DiCaprio drove Prius. <laughs> so, he's, so that's... He said that uh, so, so there's something, there must be something else uh, for new technologies to be, uh, exp to be you know, deployed rapidly as possible. So it is, we don't really know what uh, takes the consumer to choose one product over one other or uh, to prefer the climate-friendly technologies over others. And I've been in the energy area for a very long time. And uh, I love to say that uh, energy efficient automobile uh, should be the choice of the other uh, people. But I noticed that when people purchase automobile, 
energy efficiency is just one element. There are many other elements. You know this already. Just like in the business sector, I also noticed that efficiency in boilers is just one of the decisions, one of the decision element that a company decides to go for a efficient uh, you know, production methods. Bottom line is, as you mentioned, is a profit. Whether that certain el- uh, energy efficiency element contribute to uh, uh, profit, they will consider. But there are other activities that improve the profit positions. So far, the reducing labor cost, improving labor productivity, uh, is the best way to improve a profit you know, portion. And uh, it's IPCC report indicate that uh, uh, from now on, the technologies uh, must uh, be geared to not only to looking at the improving labor productivity, but also in the use of materials, in, in the productivity of materials use. Uh, that is the next uh, technological uh, shift uh, the world uh, will need. And uh, examples of tech, uh, specific technologies, I want to, can, I want to share with you. Well, I rather uh, wish not to pick one technology, uh, even if I may uh, you know, prefer to say something about that. But I truly believe in IPC, in this case, IPCC uh, reports in saying that uh, IPCC is technology neutral, just as policy neutral, that uh, we should consider that every technology within the portfolios. Report is very clear that if we exclude certain techno- technologies, the consequence is that it will increase the cost of reducing emissions. So we, have, we should welcome any technology that will contribute to reducing carbon emissions, contribute to uh, reducing carbon footprint. Thank you very much for taking my question. I know we're running out of time. I have a question about um, political will and institutions. You mentioned you want to remain optimistic. Um, I'm a millennial, and over the course of my lifetime, I've grown up with climate anxiety. That is a term that we frequently use on social media. Um, Well, the algorithm pushes it to me. (laughs) <laughs> when I'm on social media, right? But um, could you speak a little bit about the trend of increasing political will to take climate action throughout your career amongst political institutions, so states and governments? Because as a teenager and when I was an undergrad here at USC, I felt very um, discouraged and very jaded, honestly, about political will amongst Um, developed states to take significant climate action. I feel like there is a different sense of urgency today, um, which is unfortunately perpetuated by the fact that people are dying and losing their homes. Um, So as more and more people on the local level are being impacted by uh, climate change, governments are, you know, um, being like, their hands are being forced to take um, action or take the Uh, issue more seriously than they may have done in the past when we were more oil dependent, for example. So throughout the course of your um, career, could you speak a little bit about the trend of political will that you've seen um, amongst institutions? Thank you very much for being here. Sure, right, great question. And, uh, you know, the climate problem is a global problem. And uh, as one country's work may not be, you know, it's it's not enough to do any work globally. working together to reduce emissions. And now, right now, emissions uh, from the developing world are rising very rapidly. What needs to be done is, it's nothing new here. The developed world should provide help financially and technologically to developing world to pursue them to, to, to help them to pursue a climate-friendly uh, uh, economic uh, growth. And unless that happens, then 1.5 degree or 2 degree, forget it. And uh, it is a time for collaboration between developed world and developing world. Specifically, developing world needs help from developed world. Without that, no solution. I think the uh, 
And I see the end sign here. And uh, so uh, maybe just one question. Can I? Have it? Yeah, she said yes. One question. Right. Thank you for taking one more question, and thank you for your talk, too. Um, kind of a follow-up to that question. I was wondering, what is the best way to, since groups and countries have different, as you mentioned, responsibilities and abilities to respond, how do you facilitate those, or how do you propose facilitating those conversations? Because everybody will be acting in their best interests. So, um, I mean, how do you propose that those agreements um, take place? Well, you know, the Paris Agreement is a very good example, and uh, it, it emphasizes that it recognizes the differences, uh, you know, across the other uh, countries, and also it recognizes that the, uh, the, uh, any agreement has to be inclusive. And uh, if we abide by that principle, and then we may be, may be able to produce some results. Although, although uh, it says that it is a voluntary uh, uh, you know, contribution, uh, no international agreement uh, can have a uh, penalty, penalty clause there. Such a idea cannot work. The beauty of Paris Agreement is, to me, is a vo voluntary contribution. And also, at the same time, does it allows countries uh, to uh, compare among themselves to see the progress. And uh, it is a 195 countries, community of 195 uh, you know, countries, and what more can you uh, achieve? And the Paris Agreement already uh, uh, indicated that uh, there should be a, a clear uh, collaboration between developed and developing world. Just let me mention again this uh, collaboration, cooperation between the uh, developed and developing world. And uh, without that, uh, climate stabilization uh, cannot be possible. I hope that answers your question. Yes, it does. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you all for the wonderful time. Thank you. Thank you very much.